say about Johnson's own. As such, I urge my colleagues to support and swiftly pass the resolution which requests that the President of the United States grant Jock Johnson a posthumous pardon. Mr. President, I suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Mr. President. From Delaware. Mr. President, as the proceedings under the quorum call be vitiated. The objection. Mr. President, the founders of our country committed to justice and fairness for all its citizens. And in establishing a structure that would make this country uniquely strong as a democracy, gave us three co-equal branches of our government. Two of those branches have dominated the national news recently as we lurch from crisis to crisis, from fiscal cliff to sequester, the back and forth between the president and Congress, between the executive and the legislative branches has been the headline day after day. Meanwhile, the third co-equal branch, the judicial branch of our federal government has quietly gone about its business, doing its job for the American people, providing fair hearings, equal justice under the law, the basic right to a speedy resolution to any dispute. Or are they? All around this country, members of the judicial branch are getting their jobs done, but with fewer and fewer resources and support, fewer colleagues on the bench than ever before. Nearly 10% of all federal judgeships, positions for federal judges that should be filled, are vacant, empty. Leaving those judges that are on the bench overwhelmed with steadily increasing caseloads and unable to provide the level of service, certainty, and swift resolution that the American people deserve and that our government was predicated on. Because particularly when you're the one going into court seeking redress, or when you're the one facing legal action, justice delayed is justice denied. As a member of the Delaware Bar and a former federal court clerk myself, as well as a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, I've seen firsthand the consequences of this ongoing, slow-rolling crisis in our federal courts. Right now, we have more than double the judicial vacancies as we did at the same point in the last administration. The Senate has confirmed 30 fewer of President Obama's nominees than it had of President Bush's at this same time. And one of the most under-resourced circuits is right here under our nose in Washington, D.C. The D.C. Circuit is often called the second most important court in the land. Although it may not make the headlines, it may not be as visible to the American people as this ongoing fight between the Congress and the President. The D.C. Circuit decides issues of national importance, from terrorism and detention to the scope of agency power. And they have importance to every American, not just the ones who happen to live in the District of Columbia. And yet its bench is almost half empty. Congress has set the number of judgeships needed by the D.C. Circuit Court at 11, and right now they have just seven. President Bush had the opportunity to appoint four judges to the D.C. Circuit, including the 10th judicial position twice and the 11th judicial position once. Yet President Obama has been denied the opportunity to make even a single appointment to the D.C. Circuit Court. Despite four vacancies, and as a result, the per-judge caseload is today 50% higher than it was after President Bush had the opportunity to fill that last, that 11th seat. And that, Mr. President, in terms of our obligation to this co-equal branch, our obligation to the citizens of the United States, our obligation to provide an opportunity for justice, that is an outrage. Today, the Senate has the opportunity to take up and consider a highly qualified nominee to fill one of these vacancies, to start to do our job and bring this vital circuit court closer to full capacity. We can do that by confirming the nomination of a brilliant lawyer and a dedicated public servant named Caitlin Halligan. Ms. Halligan, with whom I've met, has been nominated to the D.C. Circuit Court and re-nominated to the D.C. Circuit Court and re-nominated to the D.C. Circuit Court across three sessions of Congress, the 111th, 112th, 113th. She's been nominated because of her superb qualifications and her impressive personal background. She's worked in private practice at a respected New York law firm. She's served in public service as Solicitor General for the State of New York. She's currently the General Counsel of the New York County District Attorney's Office, an office that investigates and prosecutes 100,000 criminal cases every year. 
Ms. Halligan has earned the support of her colleagues in law enforcement across the spectrum, everyone from New York City Police Commissioner Raymond Kelly to preeminent conservative lawyer Miguel Estrada have supported her nomination. The American Bar Association's standing committee unanimously gave her its ranking of highest qualification to serve, highly qualified. And yet Ms. Halligan has had to face, in my view, just outrageous distortions of her record that cause one to wonder if any nominee to this circuit would be acceptable on the merits. Ms. Halligan has withstood steady and withering political attacks on positions that she advocated while Solicitor General for the State of New York, positions that she argued on behalf of her client, New York State, and its Attorney General, not positions that represented her own personal views. And if you reflect on this, Mr. President, it is, as all practicing attorneys know, inappropriate to disqualify a judicial candidate because she has advocated a position for a client with which a certain senator might disagree or which has been rejected by a court. This fundamental principle that you do not associate an attorney with a position advocated in court has been widely shared and widely supported. In fact, Chief Justice Roberts has himself said, and I quote, it's a tradition of the American bar that goes back before the founding of our nation, that lawyers are not identified with the positions of their clients. Even so, Ms. Halligan's positions on issues such as, for example, marriage and states' rights have hardly been radical. When asked to analyze New York's marriage law, she concluded that the state statute did not provide same-sex couples with the right to marry. When presented with the question of whether a ban on same-sex marriage was legal under the New York Constitution, she merely said that there were arguments for and against and that it should be left to the courts to decide. What could be more modest than deciding that a constitutional question should be decided by the courts and not the executive branch? And yet I've heard on this floor and elsewhere her positions on this and other issues mischaracterized as extreme as out of the mainstream. In my view, this position demonstrates her great respect for our judicial process and proves that if this body confirms her to the bench, she would fairly and faithfully apply precedent in making important decisions on the D.C. Circuit. She told us directly on the Judiciary Committee that she would respect and apply precedent in other important cases, cases that touch on the Second Amendment, such as the District of Columbia versus Heller, in McDonald versus Chicago, cases that held the Second Amendment protects an individual right to keep and bear arms for self-defense. And I'm confident, despite what we've heard spun in the press about Ms. Halligan's positions, that she would faithfully respect precedent in these cases. So, Mr. President, in these two areas, I think we can see that Caitlin Halligan is not a radical or an ideologue. She is an attorney. She is a lawyer and a good one. In my view, having reviewed her qualifications, having sat through meetings, and having looked at her record, she has earned her nomination to the D.C. Circuit Court. And she deserves for this Senate to get out of the way and to stop this endless delay of consideration of qualified candidates for the bench and let her get to work. Today, the Senate has an opportunity a chance to do the right thing, to stop endless partisan political games, to break through our gridlock here and get something done in the interest of the American people and especially those who seek swift and sure justice. Every individual and business in this country has the fundamental right to a fair, fast trial, to an access to the judicial system and to the hearing of their appeals in an appropriate and timely manner. And judicial vacancies and understaffed courts at the district and the circuit level are denying them that right. This Senate and its dysfunction is denying them that right. So today I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to do our jobs, to confirm Caitlin Halligan and recommit ourselves to moving forward in a productive and bipartisan way. That, Mr. President, I thank you, and I note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Mr. President. Senator from New York. I ask unanimous consent the quorum be dispensed with. Without objection. First, let me compliment my colleague from Delaware, not only for his typically excellent remarks today, but also for his vigilance on these issues. He's a relatively newer member of the Judiciary Committee, but he has do dove, dived, jumped in to these issues with tremendous eagerness, intelligence, balance, and effectiveness. So I want to thank him for his great remarks. Now, I too rise today in enthusiastic support of the nominee to the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit of Caitlin Halligan. Ms. Halligan has been waiting for an up or down vote for 23 months. Even more importantly, the entire country has been waiting to fill this position, a judgeship on the second most important court in the nation for 23 months. The question that we're going to answer tomorrow is, can we take some of our bipartisan goodwill our desire to legislate and get things done for the country and apply it to a nominee who is the very picture of moderation, mainstream legal thinking, a nominee who's dedicated her entire career to public service, a nominee who would be only the sixth woman to join this court in its 220-year history. That's 212-year history. That's right. There have only been five women to serve on the D.C. Kirk Circuit in 212 years. And, Mr. President, the D.C. Circuit is currently a third vacant. Four of its 11 slots, 37 percent, are without active judges. Halligan is one of the two nominees for these four slots. Now, two years ago, when Halligan was first filibustered, Many of my colleagues decided they couldn't support a cloture motion because she would have been the 10th judge on an 11-member court, a court they, that they perceived as overstaffed and underworked. I take issue with the fundamental premise. The D.C. Circuit hears the most complex and many of the most important cases in the country. The court hears appeals from virtually every regulatory agency, Review statutes has jurisdiction over numerous terrorism cases, including those from Guantanamo Bay. But even if I were to accept this faulty premise that the court somehow needs fewer judges than it ever had, the court that hears the most complex cases, the court is now near a crisis point. There are only seven active judges currently sitting. What's more, the caseload per judge has risen by 21 percent, 21 percent since the last judge was confirmed, and that was under President Bush's administration. So I think there's now more than a compelling evidence that the caseload-based argument against Halligan is gone. And you would have thought that our colleagues on the other side of the aisle would say, okay, four vacancies, last vacancy filled under Bush, we can now move to support her. But they don't. So what else could possibly prevent a vote on Halligan? Is it her ideology? Mr. President, I submit to you and my colleagues, it cannot possibly be her ideology. If zero is extremely liberal and 10 is extremely conservative, Halligan falls right in the sweet spot of judges whom both President Obama and President Clinton have generally nominated, five, some fours, maybe even a six or two. Opposing Halligan on her ideology, opposing even a cloture vote based on her ideology, can mean only one of two things. First, based on her ideology, can mean only one of two things. First, that some of my colleagues have misread her record. Let me clear up a few things today. Halligan is not anti-gun or anti-Second Amendment. She has clearly said at her hearing she fully supports the individual Second Amendment right to bear arms, as the Supreme Court decided in Heller. Her briefs for the State of New York, which were product liability cases, not Second Amendment cases, were briefs for a client and not her own views, just like Chief Justice Roberts described his work for clients. In fact, Halligan, like many of my colleagues, enjoys shooting and does so from time to time on weekends. 
Anyone, anyone who accepted a meeting with her would have discovered this. Halligan's not anti-law enforcement in any way. She spent most of her career in law enforcement. New York Police Commissioner Ray Kelly, hardly a shrinking violet, hardly a wallflower. He's a tough-on-crime guy. That's why I like him so much. And he's one of the most respected law chiefs in the country, has written a letter in full support of her. Specifically, Halligan has lived through the consequences of terrorism. She lives not far from the World Trade Center site. She represented the Development Corporation there in its post-9-11 efforts. She's personally handled terrorism cases for the Manhattan DA's office. In her hearing, she stated her beliefs regarding the executive's power to detain terrorism suspects. Mr. President, I've heard evasive nominees. She was not evasive. She gave complete and clear answers to every single question that, she, that was asked. The second possible reason my colleagues might decide to oppose cloture for such a reasonable candidate and such a gifted lawyer is that they want to put their own judges on the D.C. Circuit, and they'd rather leave it vacant than move Halligan. In other words, it's not that Halligan's extremely ex unacceptably extreme in her views, it's simply that she doesn't share all their views. Now, it's one thing to fight against certain judicial nominees with the sincere belief that they are outside the judicial mainstream. It's another for my colleagues to fight against a nominee because they disagree with him or her. I always look for judges when I nominate them who are moderate. I don't like judges too far right, that's obvious. But I equally don't like judges too far left. And my judicial panel will tell you, if I think a judge is too far left, I won't nominate him. Because judges at the extremes, whichever extreme, tend to want to make law, not interpret law. The best judges are those who see things clearly and fairly, not through an ideological lens, whether that lens is colored red or blue. There are judges who understand the law. Those are judges who understand the law, understand the role of each branch of government, understand the proper balance between state and federal power, and understand the people who come before the bench. So I'd say one other thing to my colleagues, and I just finished working with a bunch four of us on each side, on coming up with a compromise so we could work together better. I want to let my colleagues know, I've done it personally with a few, that this vote, the desire to actually filibuster Caitlin Halligan, is really causing a lot of consternation on our side. Clearly, clearly, this is a judge who deserves an up or down vote. One of the reasons that many of my colleagues, myself included, thought that we ought to change the rules was because a judge like Caitlin Halligan, a nominee like Caitlin Halligan, should not be filibustered. And it seems, and I look, I, I have respect for my friends on the other side of the aisle. But when they say, one of my colleagues I heard say this morning, that this one brief that she signed with a bunch of others was extraordinary circumstances? That just didn't ring true. If that's extraordinary circumstances, wearing the wrong color tie or the wrong color blouse would be extraordinary circumstances. She has a long record. They can hardly find anything. And they come up with this one brief. They may not like it, but to say it's extraordinary circumstances? No. So I'd say to my colleagues, I'd plead with them. We're trying to start off on a good foot here. We're working together better than we've worked in a long time. Each side has to give. Part of the deal, amendments. You're going to get a lot of amendments on the other side of the aisle. But part of our deal is not to block things for the sake of blocking them or because there's another agenda. And that goes not just for blocking legislation, but for blocking nominees. Now, it is true, in the deal we made, the agreement we made, it was only district court judges that could go seriatim. But the spirit of our compromise applies to this Court of Appeals nominee. And I have not heard a single good reason why she should be filibustered. 
People who disagree with her, I voted against some of George Bush's nominees because I thought their views were not quite mine, even if they were not extreme. And everyone on the other side of the aisle has the right to do the same, but not a filibuster. This court is a very important court. We know it makes lots of decisions about government, but that does not give license to block a nominee on what seem to be trivial grounds, inconsequential grounds given a long career. So again, I would urge, plead with my colleagues, please reconsider this cloture vote. Please give her the 60 votes she needs so that she can come to the floor and get the up or down vote she's waited 23 months for. It violates fairness. It violates the comity that we're trying to restore in this body. It violates simple justice to vote no on cloture and to filibuster Caitlin Halligan. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Minnesota. Mr. President, I want to thank uh, the Senator Lee for allowing me uh, to go for three minutes here before he is, has the next turn. I appreciate that. I come to the floor as some of my colleagues have done already. We just heard from the great Senator from New York uh, to discuss the nomination of Caitlin Halligan to the D.C. Circuit Court. Caitlin Halligan is currently the general counsel at the New York County District Attorney's Office. New York County is just another name for Manhattan, so we are talking about a big county and a big office. In fact, it handles about 100,000 criminal cases each year. Before that, she was the Solicitor General of the State of New York for six years and the head of the appellate practice at a major law firm. She also clerked on both the D.C. Circuit and the U.S. Supreme Court and has argued five cases in front of the United States Supreme Court. That is a resume. The nonpartisan American Bar Association Committee that reviews every federal judicial nominee gave Halligan its highest possible rating. And over 100 women law professors and deans wrote a letter saying that Halligan is exceptionally qualified to serve on the D.C. Circuit. There is no question that she has the experience, ability, and intellect to sit on the federal bench, Mr. President. It's also important to recognize that she is not an ideological or a partisan nominee. Well-known lawyer Carter Phillips, who was assistant to the Solicitor General in the Reagan administration, has said that Halligan is one of those extremely smart, thoughtful, measured, and effective advocates, and that she would be a first-rate judge. Phillips is not the only conservative lawyer to endorse Halligan. For example, Miguel Estrada signed a letter from 21 prominent attorneys which stated that Halligan brings reason, insight, and judgment to all matters and would serve with distinction and fairness. Given support like that from people like Miguel Estrada, I don't think it can be said that Halligan is an extreme ideologue or that she is outside the mainstream of legal thought. Her nomination should not and cannot be blocked. This is a great candidate who will make a great judge. As New York City Police Commissioner Ray Kelly said about her, she possesses the three qualities important for a nominee, intelligence, a judicial temperament, and personal integrity. She must be confirmed without delay. Filibusters, Mr. President, filibusters are about debating issues. This is an individual. We can't amend her. We simply have to decide whether she is qualified to be on the bench. There is absolutely no doubt. People may not agree with every single thing she said. I don't think anyone in this chamber agrees with every single thing that judges have said or that people we've put on the Supreme Court have said. But we somehow came together and stood up for one simple principle, that our job is to decide if someone's qualified, if they can do the job, if they can interpret the law. This candidate can do it, and she can do it well. If senators ultimately wish to oppose her nomination, fine, and that is their choice. But they shouldn't filibuster an extremely qualified candidate. Let her have an up or down vote. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Utah. 
Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent uh, for leave to engage in a colloquy with Senator Barrasso for a period of time not to exceed 15 minutes. Without objection. Mr. President, the President of the United States has spent the last few weeks campaigning around our great country at taxpayer expense, telling Americans about what uh, he characterized as the catastrophic impact of the sequester. He said, for example, that the sequester will visit hardship on a whole lot of people. He said it will jeopardize our military readiness. It will eviscerate job-creating investments in education and energy and medical research. He said the ability of emergency responders to help communities respond to and recover from disasters will be disregarded. Border Patrol agents will see their hours reduced. FBI agents will be furloughed. He said that federal prosecutors will have to close cases and simply let criminals go. Air traffic controllers and airport security will see cutbacks, which means more delays at airports across the country. He said that thousands of teachers and educators will be laid off and that tens of thousands of parents will have to scramble to find childcare for their kids. And he also continued, hundreds of thousands of Americans will lose access to primary care and preventive care like flu vaccinations and cancer screenings. Today we see the severely exaggerated, if not disproven. People in my home state of Utah have found the effects of the sequester to be not quite what the president predicted. One of our local Utah news stations reported that there were, quote, no signs of sequester pain, close quote, at the airports. When asked about sequestration, one Utah responded, if they can't handle a 2% reduction in spending, then I guess we need to get better and brighter, meaning get better and brighter people to be running our government. Other press reports indicate the administration's doomsday claims have misled the public. The Washington Post reported that education, the education secretary's claims about teacher layoffs turned out simply not to be true. And Politico recently published a, sh a story uh, showing the president's claims about some capital staff getting pay cuts uh, to be false. So I, I, I ask you, uh, uh, Senator Barrasso, after all these scare tactics over the last two weeks, uh, does the president have a credibility problem with the American people when it comes to the sequester? Well, uh, Madam President, I believe that my, uh, my friend from Utah is absolutely correct. Uh, there is a credibility gap here. Uh, these uh, modest cuts uh, should prompt Washington to take a closer look at how we spend taxpayers' money. Um, I, I saw today that the White House is now, because they claim, because of the sequester, canceling White House tours. Uh, I mean, astonishing when they say they're not going to cut the personnel there in terms of the, 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 the security, but they're going to cancel the tours. Well, I would invite people from all around the country who are planning trips to Washington to come to the Senate, come to the House, come to the Capitol. We will make sure that they, they receive uh, tours if, they, if, they, if they'd like. But uh, you talk about the, the loss of credibility. The, uh, you know, there's the Washington Post evaluates statements by, by folks, and over the last week there has been a, they give what are called Pinocchios for those not telling the truth. Uh, and there have been a parade of Pinocchios, a dozen of these Pinocchios given. Uh, one with the president's uh, false claim on Friday during his news conference of Capitol janitors receiving a pay cut. They gave him four Pinocchios for that, just not true. Uh, on the threat uh, to uh, meals for, uh, free meals for seniors, Pinocchios there. Uh, the Secretary of Education's false claim of, of pink slips for teachers, another four Pinocchios. Uh, the, 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 the claim that uh, 70,000 children would lose access to Head Start and early uh, Head Start services, another two Pinocchios there. And, and, and you had mentioned the uh, uh, concerns about the, the, the FAA uh, with uh, furloughs and closed air towers. The verdict is still pending uh, on that. So you have a parade of Pinocchios with an administration at a time when the American people know that so much of their taxpayer dollars are being wasted. And I traveled around Wyoming this past weekend. People at home think at least half of the money they send to Washington is wasted. So it's time now to take an opportunity to eliminate was a wasteful, uh, duplicative spending. We should streamline federal bureaucracy. We should make government programs more efficient. Uh, we should be more uh, thoughtful in terms of how targeted cuts will work to ensure vital programs continue without interruption. But at the end of uh, the day, we should make sure taxpayers are getting value 
for their hard-earned uh, dollars. Uh, the administration doesn't see it that way at all. Instead of promoting responsible spending, the administration is promoting panic. And um, as, you, as Senator Lee has pointed out, the administration uh, is threatening uh, the American people with pink slips for teachers, cuts to airport security, cost to, uh, cuts to the Coast Guard patrols, cutting border patrol and enforcement, uh, closing national parks, cutting food safety inspections, eliminating Head Start, Meals on Wheels, the list goes on. We need to be honest with the American people that we are $16.5 trillion in debt. It's not a threat. It's the truth. Uh, and we can no longer afford to ignore the truth. Uh, Washington is burying our children and grandchildren under a mountain of debt. And if we don't treat Washington's spending addiction, the problem is just going to get worse. So we must not allow the debt to tie the hands of future generations and prevent them from reaching their dreams. I believe we have to take responsibility for the reality that we're facing and uh, have to take action to change the course that we're on. Uh, and of course that means difficult decisions have to be made, but these decisions don't need to be reckless. Uh, they don't need to be dangerous. They don't need to Im imperil our students, teachers, military, senior citizens, or our national security. They need to be smart, they need to be targeted, uh, and they need to maximize the value of each dollar spent and minimize the risks and the burdens to taxpayers. So I believe uh, to my colleague from, from Utah that rather than hitting taxpayers uh, where, they're, where they'll feel it the most, the administration really has an obligation, I think, a responsibility to work hard to cut spending where the need is the least. And, and I know the, the leadership that you've shown uh, on cut this, not that, uh, really is something that I think Americans uh, would, would just agree with completely. Thank you, Senator Barrasso, and I find it interesting that what you observed uh, on the streets uh, of towns like Evanston and Cheyenne and, and Gillette in Wyoming is backed up by a, a, a recent poll conducted by Gallup, and that poll shows that Americans understand that a lot of money that Washington spends is wasted. This Gallup poll showed that the average American believes that Washington wastes 51 cents out of every dollar that it spends. 51 cents, more than half of every dollar that hardworking Americans earn and send to Washington gets wasted. Congress and the President should be working together to target, reform, reduce, and eliminate wasteful spending that the American people are, are noticing. And uh, they should be working to get rid of and reform ineffective programs. The President, meanwhile, is threatening to make cuts to government spending, as painful as it can possibly be. Instead of targeting waste, the President's using scare tactics to persuade Americans that cuts have to come first from important services, like law enforcement, national security, border patrol, first responders, and educators. Just today, the administration announced that it was going to furlough school teachers who educate the children of military families on U.S. military bases. Recognizing, of course, that you know, most school systems are operated at the state and local level and funded primarily at the state and local level. Um, but he started focusing on educators who teach on, on base to military families, suggesting that those teachers would have to be furloughed. Republicans have a better idea. The uh, Senate Budget Committee, and in particular the ranking Republican serving on the Senate Budget Committee has found that the cost of President Obama's recent golf vacation with Tiger Woods um, cost Americans an amount of money that, if saved, would have allowed us to prevent the furlough of 341 federal employees. Can the President cancel a vacation or two in order to avoid some of these furloughs? That's the question that has prompted us to start this information campaign that we refer to as Cut This not that, as depicted in this graphic here, showing under cut this, golf vacations by the president, and under the not that, showing military-based teachers. That's what we should be focusing on. That's where we ought to prioritize, is on identifying those areas where there can be a lower priority attached to something that we're already spending. Cut this, not that, sends a message to the President and to the American people that Washington should be setting spending priorities rather than wasting their hard-earned tax dollars. So, Senator Barrasso, how, how can it be that this administration chooses to cut essential services like national security, border enforcement, first responders, and educators 
uh, instead of the fraud and waste that's so rampant in the federal government? Well, I, I appreciate the question, and I would, I would say that uh, you're, you're absolutely correct. The cuts threatened by the administration simply defy common sense and logic. Uh, despite claims to the contrary, the president actually does have a choice. Uh, he can take a thoughtful, reasoned approach to implementing the sequester by cutting wasteful spending, and that we all know exists. Uh, or he can continue to threaten and scare the American people with needless cuts to vital programs and services. Uh, I put together a list of uh, a few places where I would encourage the president uh, to look for a reasonable cuts because there are so many programs that are inefficient, ineffective, uh, or just uh, overlap with other programs. You know, there are um, over 80 economic development programs that uh, operate out of four different cabinet agencies, Department of Agriculture, Commerce, Housing and Urban Development, Small Business. There are, there are 173 programs promoting science, technology, engineering, and math uh, education across 13 agencies. Now, these are important things, but do you need 173 programs when one department of, of, the, of the government doesn't know what the other one is, is, is doing? Uh, Twenty agencies oversee more than 50 financial literacy programs. Uh, there are more than 50 programs in supporting entrepreneurs across four different departments uh, of government. There are 47 different job training programs. And are, is job training important? Absolutely. 47 different programs, nine different agencies, uh, cost $18 billion uh, in fiscal year 2009. Only five of the programs of these 47, only five of them have had an impact study completed since 2004 to see if they actually work and whether participants in the program actually get a job. These haven't been reviewed since 2004. Do we know that they work? Do we need 47? Could they be improved upon? So, you know, you know we're looking at this sequester. The president proposed the sequester. The president signed the sequester into law. And now he claims that he can't live with the effects. Uh, I'm here to tell you that he's wrong. Uh, responsibly implementing the cuts from the sequester is, is not only possible, I believe it's necessary, as we see here. Cut this, not that. Uh, th this, this debate isn't about, as we read in the Washington Post, that the president is trying to force it into the election of the House of Representatives in 2014. It's about the economy and the future of our country. And it's not just about smaller government, it's about smarter government. People think they're not getting value for their money. So I believe it's, it's past the time for Washington to take the smarter approach uh, to our nation's spending addiction. And I appreciate the leadership of the senator from Utah. Thank you, Senator Barrasso. It's important for us to recognize that all these observations draw us back to one central conclusion, which is that the sequester and wasteful spending that we see so rampant throughout our federal government are the natural product of the failure by the majority leadership in the United States Senate to work with Republicans to pass a budget. Republicans last year in the Senate proposed three different budgets, uh, receiving as many as 42 votes, 42 more votes than the president's budget received in this body last year or the year before, or in the House in the last year or the year before. But the majority party in the Senate, those in charge of this body, uh, elected to lead in this body, have now refused even to propose a budget for the country for more than 1,400 days. We have spending priorities. I'm sure my friends across the aisle have spending priorities as well. It's time that we do the right thing for the American people and that we sit down and we have an open, honest dialogue with the American people and with each other to hammer out these ideas and come up with a budget that fairly and accurately represents the priorities of the American people. But we need to pass a budget, and I urge my colleagues to do so. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor. Madam President, I suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Senator from Oklahoma. Uh, I'd ask that the quorum call be dispensed with and speak as if in morning business, at such time I may consume. Without objection. And I'd also ask unanimous consent to use an oversized poster. Uh, without objection. There's been a lot made of uh, the sequester and the things that may or may not happen associated with it, uh, having spent the last eight years looking at the federal government. Um, I wrote the Secretary of Agriculture a letter this week outlining some things that they could do that would not put in jeopardy <coughs> food inspection and other things. Um, in my eight years of looking at the Department of Agriculture, there's extensive waste and duplication. The GAO has confirmed that. Uh, and those things should be cut first and eliminated and consolidated before staffs that are in critical positions are furloughed. The USDA currently employs 120 thousand employees and they have over 16,000 offices. I mean just thinking about 16,000 offices ought to give us a pause. <coughs> Why would any agency, <coughs> no matter what their requirements are, need that number of offices? <coughs> the agency notes <coughs> on their website if they were a private company they would be the sixth largest private company in America. That's how big the USDA is and how uh, effusive. Today there's one USDA employee for every eight farmers. One USDA employee for every eight or people employed in the farm area. Or overall one, one USDA employee for every 18 farms, primary or otherwise. So weekend farmers have a USDA employee and regular farmers. People who are primary business, there's an employee for every eight, one of, eight of them. <clears throat> At the end of 2012, USDA was sitting on $12 billion in unobligated federal balances. In other words, that's money that's sitting in an account that hadn't been obligated to any purpose, sitting there waiting to be spent, that we borrowed money, $12 billion, that they have not obligated that money for. One of the things that my staff discovered is the USDA has upcoming conferences 
in terms of food tasting and wine tasting on the West Coast. Now, in normal times, there wouldn't be anything wrong with federal employees traveling to the West Coast to both encourage and assess uh, where we are in terms of a, some of our agricultural production. Uh, but I would think that maybe this is one of the things that the U.S. Department of Agriculture ought to cancel, given where we are and the threat uh, that's been put out there in terms of food safety uh, that has been announced in terms of <clears throat> layoffs or time off for agriculture department employees. Two USDA agencies, the Rural Development and Agricultural Marketing Service, are sponsoring the 26th Annual California farm conference, Small Farm Conference next week. In addition to speakers from USDA agency, the gathering will feature field trips and tasting uh, receptions. The tasting reception, according to their website, is the most well-attended networking event of the conference and showcases the regional bounty for local farms, chefs, wineries, breweries, bakeries, and other food purveyors. <coughs> and special guest chefs will turn donated la local agricultural products into tasty dishes to sample with exceptional wines provided. There's nothing wrong with that in normal times. There's plenty wrong with sending multiple employees to these types of conferences when we find ourselves in the position that we find ourselves in today. <clears throat> these conferences, I'm sure, are fun, interesting, and even educational getaways for uh, USDA employees. But food inspecting rather than food tasting should be USDA's priority at this time. So, <clears throat> and not just to pick on them, but the, the thing is, is <clears throat> Americans aren't aware of how expansive and duplicative many of the programs we have. In the domestic food assistant programs, just inside, <clears throat> this is what GAO shows us that we have run. 18 federal different programs across three departments that spend $60 billion a year on this program. According to GAO, the availability of multiple programs with similar benefits helps ensure that those in need have access to nutritious food, but can also does increase the administrative cost of these programs. So while our goal is great, the fact that we have this many programs doing essentially similar things with similar overheads, GAO's recommendation was to con do consolidation. Fifteen of these programs are running, run by the Department of Agriculture, ranging from SNAP program to fresh fruit and vegetable program and a special milk program. According to GAO, the effectiveness of 11 of these 18 programs is suspect. And the reason it's suspect is nobody's done any oversight. No member of Congress has done an oversight on it. Not the Budget Committee, not the Appropriation Committee, or the Agricultural Committee. We also have, inside the USDA, research and education activities. within the rural development programs that duplicate predominantly existing programs of almost every other agency in the federal government. Let me say that again. Almost every one of these programs are duplicated in another agency of the federal government. In other words, we're layering on. They both have the same goals, the same hoped for outcomes, one run by one agency, here's the ones that are run just by USDA. According to GAO, the Rural Development Program administers 40 housing programs, business and community infrastructure and facility program, as well as energy, health care, telecom programs, most of which duplicate the initiatives of other agencies, yet under the guise of serving exclusively rural citizens. Rural populations are not excluded from the other programs which are run with the same purpose that serve the general population. 
According to the Congressional Research Service, more than 88 programs administered by 16 different federal agencies do the exact same thing that these programs do. So we have 88 other programs from 16 other federal agencies that are targeting rural economic development and needs. It's not hard to see why we're in trouble. And yet, the GAO has done the work we've asked them to do. The appropriate committees have not addressed any of these issues. They've not offered any amendments or bills to reduce the consolidation or at least look at the outcomes and the cost-benefit ratio of having multiple layers of programs doing the same thing. Let me just give you some questionable expenditures just that we've seen in the last year. $54 million loan to build a casino. $1.6 million in loans uh, for a, as, a asbestos removal company. Created hundreds of jobs in Guatemala and eventually went out of business and defaulted on the loan. 2.5 million low interest loans to the birthplace of Country Music Association for construction of its Smithsonian style cultural heritage center. A Tennessee county spent $10,000 in federal rural federal development grant to just upside, upgrade its tourism website. 12,500 went to Milk and Honey Soap LLC for marketing its soaps and lotions made from goat milk and beeswax. I mean, these are private businesses. And we're taking taxpayer money, or we're borrowing the money, and we're subsidizing private individual businesses with grants. We also have, uh, within the USDA Research and Education Act activities, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture spent $706 million last year on research and education activities through more than 45 different programs. <clears throat> Meanwhile, their Agricultural Research Service has a budget of $1.1 billion annually and is home to additional eight federal research and educational activity programs. So what we have is layer after layer after layer, most of them well-intentioned, not denying that some of these are significant roles for the federal government, but Congress is the problem because we haven't addressed any of the recommendations that the Government Accountability Office has given us in the two reports thus far and the final report that will come out this year on overlap and duplication. Finally, I'd like to talk about the USDA's market access program. At the request of Congress, the United States Department of Agriculture has spent more than $2 billion on the market access program, which has directly subsidized the advertising of some of the most profitable companies and trade associations, trade associations doing business overseas. So we're subsidizing Companies like Welch's, Sunkist, Blue Diamond, combined sales of greater than $2 billion a year. And we gave them $6 million last year to advertise their products. Now, it's one thing to promote exports, but we don't do that with every other business in America. Not every business gets, that has $2 billion in sales gets $6 million of federal taxpayers' money to promote their products overseas. So we have this disparity. I don't know if this is good policy or bad policy. What I do know is, is it, it's indiscriminate in terms of, it's discriminatory in terms of how we treat one group of businesses versus another group of business. Also receiving money from taxpayers for private overseas advertising are trade groups like Tyson Foods, Purina, Georgia Pacific, Jack Daniels, Hershey's, the California wine industry has domestic sales of $18 billion a year. They took in $7 million to promote their products overseas. The Cotton Council, on behalf of the merit, received $20 million from Market Access Program and another $4.7 million from USDA Market Development Program. So I, I come to the floor so that the American people can see is we've got plenty of ways to save money. What we have is an intransigence in Congress to do the hard work and also 
and intransigence by the administration to recognize the need to lead on eliminating these areas of duplication. Last week on the floor, I put a letter into the record from the mayor of McAllister, Oklahoma. Uh, the, the president pro tem at the present time is a native of Oklahoma, and she knows that town. And he had a budget shortfall. And he outlined the steps that he went through with the help of the city manager to meet that. And, and they did it in a way that we would all be proud of. And he gave us an example. T today I want to submit for the record a le letter from the uh, mayor of Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors in terms of what they've done. And this is a letter I received in 2011 when we started raising the issue of duplication and making tough choices so that we continue to provide benefits we continue to create and support a safety net for those that are truly dependent on us, but we don't waste money that we don't have spending on things that we don't absolutely need. And I, I would put forward, you know, when we have the multitude of programs and the overlap, we as members of Congress don't have an excuse for not fixing that. Because the things that are critical in people's lives eventually are going to suffer. Every dollar that we spend on low priority, priority duplication, every dollar that we spend that doesn't have a metric to say it's doing what it should be doing, is eventually going to be a dollar that's not there to support a food stamp recipient or, uh, uh, or a Medicaid recipient or housing for the indigent or care for the homeless or implementing justice grant programs for policing and tribal courts. So it's not a matter of just solving the duplication problem. It's a matter of the arithmetic that's going to hit our country and that by delaying the time at which we decide that we're going to address this multitude, which is now 1,400 programs through the first two years of reports from GAO and $367 billion of expenditures. And that doesn't count the other $800 billion that goes out of the federal government every year for grants that also address some of these same issues. So the, the time is now. Sequester gives us a good time to start looking at priorities. And one of the things I'm thankful for, uh, for is we have tremendous federal employees. We're starting to hear them speak up now on what can be cut, what is wasteful? They now feel the freedom to not be criticized because they're going to be, take a critical eye of the way American taxpayer dollars are being spent in their own agency. And we're starting to hear from them. Here's things we're doing we shouldn't be doing. Here's things that are not a priority. Rather than lay off a, a meat inspector, maybe we ought to do this. Cut this, not that. You know, we ought to cut out wine tastings for federal employees and keep the meat inspectors employed. There's no reason we need to furlough the first. With the waste in the Department of Agriculture, there's no reason that the first significant program, any significant program of the Department of Agriculture, ought to suffer a furlough or a layoff. There's no reason for it, because there's billions of dollars there that are not wisely spent, well intended, not questioning motives, but poorly spent with poor return. And when you have two programs doing the same thing, let me describe for you what happens on the beneficiary end of that. People don't know which is where there's a need. You get across them. what the requirement is in one program is a different requirement in another program. In terms of duplicated grants, what we have is people who apply for a grant and get it from one arm of the Department of Agriculture, then go over here and make the same application from another arm of agriculture, get the same grant, and then go to one of the other agencies that are doing the same thing and get another grant for the same thing. All of them not knowing that each have given a grant for the same purpose. So it's just not good business practices, it's not good management, and it's not good stewardship for the future of our country. So I'd ask my colleagues to think about the great work that the Government Accountability Office has done. They've done great work for us, and we failed to act on it. And it's time we start acting. Come April 1st, we'll see the final report from the GAO, where they now, over four years, will have looked at every program in the federal government. And they're going to be able to give us a list. 
And I've come out here with my big charts and shown what the list of duplications are. We're going to have three or four more charts that they're going to say the same thing. Think about how discouraging it is for the people at GAO who do all this hard work. Think about how discouraging it is for the people who are trying to meet the needs in the individual agencies to know that we're actually duplicating things with poor results. We are not meeting our requirements under our oath. We're not meeting the moral requirements to be prudent with American taxpayers' money. And in the long run, the people that will suffer for it will be the very people that we intend to help. Because if, in fact, we don't do these things and we don't respond in a way that creates a positive vision for our country in terms of growth again and a positive vision in terms of responsible behavior by Congress, ultimately the arithmetic swallows us up. And I'll close with this. If you take today's budget, when the Federal Reserve starts unwinding the quantitative easing they've done, these very low, artificially low interest rates. Or if something would happen where the world economy would look at us and say, we don't think you're deserving of your AAA minus rating, the difference in interest costs historically is about 3 to 4 percent. And let's take a conservative estimate. Let's say it's 3. Our historical average is 5.83 percent what we borrow money at historically over the last 50 years. And we're borrowing at under 2% right now. 3% times $17 trillion you know, is $510 billion a year. And we all lose when that happens. And how do we lose? Because the dollars we're going to be spending on that additional interest cost is a dollar that isn't going to help somebody that's homeless. It's a dollar that's not going to provide food that needs to be provided for those that are depending on us. It's a dollar that's not going to go to match the FMAP for Medicaid. And consequently, the cuts that we will make then will be much harsher than the cuts if we decide to do it proactively now. And you don't have to have a partisan disagreement about the goal of a program. But certainly we should be able to come together saying we don't want to duplicate things. We want to have good outcomes. We want to put metrics on it to measure to see if it's working. There can't be any disagreement on that. That's just plain good old common horse sense. And yet, no action on anything in three and a half years on any of these recommendations by the Government Accountability. Now, the administration has paid attention. I'll give them credit. In a lot of areas where they've seen this, they've done what they can do, but we have not. I don't want to be the heritage of my time in the Senate is when we were the, we were the Congresses that failed to meet the challenge. I believe our country can cheat history. If you look at history, it's not great for republics. They've all failed. But we have the opportunity to cheat history. And the way we do it is by getting off our rears and starting doing the job that we were sent up here to do, which is oversight and legislate the elimination of waste, abuse, and duplication. And we can do that. But it requires leadership. It requires leadership on the part of Senator Reid, on the part of Senator McConnell, every committee chair, every ranking member, it requires leadership that we're going to do that. And I'm proud to say that Tom Carper, chairman of the Homeland Security, we have a plan to oversight all of Homeland Security over the next four years, the whole thing, and the rest of the government as well, because we don't really believe that the rest of the committees are going to do it. So we've, we're building our staffs to oversight, to grab this information, to make cogent recommendations and legislation where we can that will actually address these problems. We're way past the starting point of when we should have begun. But it's not too late. But it requires us to make a decision. Are we more interested in the parochial benefits of allowing continuing programs that are not effective or duplicative to continue to run because we won't get any blowback or are we courageous enough to say we're going to do the right thing for the right reasons for the long-term well-being of our country? I believe that's the feeling.
of most of the members of the Senate. I just think we needed the leadership to call us to act. With that, I yield the floor and notice the absence of core. The clerk will call the roll.